Right. Hello, everyone. All filtering through. All Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello and welcome um, to uh, one of the live talks that we're doing as a part of the John Arben uh, virtual open weekend. Um, it's super nice to see so many of you joining us and more filtering through. We're nearly, well, we're 119 now. And um, you'll be hearing the lovely Amanda speak. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Okay. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for asking me. <laughs> I think those faces popping up. Yeah, no, there's, there's now 127 of, uh, of us all uh, wanting to learn a little bit about uh, spinning, which is super exciting. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, and would you like to start by introducing yourself and what you're going to tell us all about? Uh, well, if you don't know already, I'm Amanda Hannaford. I've uh, been a spinner now for, oh dear, 36, 37 years. Okay. Um, what I'm planning on doing today is want to introduce people because we're aiming at more for beginners, I want to sort of say a little a bit about how you would choose either a spindle, a treadle wheel or an electric wheel, maybe what sort of things you might be looking for. Um, and then how to set them up and use them if you've not done be that before. And then we're going to go on to actually three different ways of spinning um, the tops. Uh, and I've got samples of John Arben tops here, so we're going to have, have a, you know, have a look at how different ways of spinning to get different effects. Yeah. So you say you've been spinning for thirty six years. What what was it that got you into it? Um. Oh, not long after we were married. Um. It's going to be sort of mid eighties. We were on holiday in Wales and went to St. Fagans, the open air museum. Mm -hmm. And um, I was looking around and went into this little cottage and it was a bright, really bright, sunny day outside. So I went into this dark little cottage and it took me a while for my eyes to get used to the change of light. And this huge great wheel sort of came into focus in the fireplace by the cottage. And there was, it looked like there was someone stood by it. But when, you know, I stood there a minute or two getting used to it and nobody moved. And then I realised it was just, a, you know, it's just a dummy stood there. But it's supposed to show somebody using this great wheel. And then at the side of it, there was all this information book. And I was absolutely fascinated. I was coming from Yorkshire. I knew all about knitting wools and things like that. But I just never really thought about, you know, before the mills where wool came from. You know, it just magically appeared, I presumed didn't know anything about spinning. So I was absolutely fascinated by it. And then on the way out the museum, we went through the shop and on the shelf, I found this little packet of washed wool with a, a spindle and uh, it was a Middle Eastern type with the hook on the top, what we call the high world today. That was very, very unusual in the UK in those days. And there was a little instruction sheet in it and that's it. That was me set off. I never looked back. Um, you know, I, it, and then I found the same holiday, I found a little booklet that said everything you know need to know about spinning on a drop spindle. Fine. There was probably about two, maybe three years with the spindle. Mm -hmm. And then I, I very nicely, I was given a my first treadle wheel for my fifth wedding anniversary, which is wood. Oh, mm. lovely. So, mm, like, oh, yes, that's. So I've had a wheel for 36 years, so I've been spinning a bit longer than that even. Yeah. Wonderful. That's such a, a thoughtful um, anniversary present. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love one. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll leave you to um, tell us what you would like to, and I'll, uh, I'll listen and I'll filter through any questions we might get as we okay. as we go. Okay, right. So we'll look at spindles first. Then, um, if you're a beginner, you're going to want to be looking for something that has a wide whirl. Not too heavy. Um, if you get something this size in wood, 
then you're probably going to find it's, it's heavy. It's what we term a boat anchor, and they're not really good for anybody to begin on. So something with a, a wide whirl and not too heavy. Now, the reason we say a wide whirl is there's a little bit of um, physics involved in spindles. If you have a, a, whirl, a wide whirl that throws the weight out, it spins slowly and keeps going. If you have a spindle with a smaller whirl with a weight closer to the shaft, then that will spin a lot faster, but it doesn't spin as long. So when you're beginning, you want something that spins a bit slower, but keeps going. Okay. Now, there are various ways of doing it. If you're going to go for a uh, commercially made spindle and not my cheapy homemade one, but that these actually are brilliant. You can't go far wrong with learning on one of those. They're, they're so balanced, you know, because this CD, if you put it into your computer, it's designed to spin very smoothly at very high speeds. So it's, they're really quite good. But if you're looking at a commercial spindle, you're looking for some way of putting weight onto the outside, away from the shaft. And on this one, it's got a heavier wood and it's thicker and it's also got brass dots in it. So that's one way of doing it. Another way, this is this is a bit of a smaller one, but it's a, a good one to show you, is you can have cutouts. So you cut out the wood that's nearer the shaft and the more of the weight is on the outside. A good way to look at that um, would be to think of an uh, ice skater. If you have an ice skater doing twirls, when they stick their arms out straight, they're a bit slower and they keep going. And then when they pull their arms in above their heads or down by the sides, they suddenly speed up, but then stop quite quickly. It's the same sort of thing. It's all to do, you know, the, the physics of it. The look. So what you need to remember as a beginner is something with a weight, you know, quite wide whirl where the weight's pushed outwards. OK. Uh, the other one that might be very good for a beginner would be something like, again, I've got a rather large one. This is on the bow tanker side, but it's a good one to actually be able to show you. Um, and this one is what we call a Turkish spindle. OK, and those, again, because you've got the weight on these arms sticking well out from the shaft, then those tend to go quite slowly and quite a long time. So they're another good one as well for a beginner. Maybe not one quite that big, but you can get nice small ones. Okay, dinky little one there. And the added advantage with these is the way you wind the yarn, you make a ball already. Okay, so that if you've not come across one before, I'll just do a quick demonstration. So you've got your ball of yarn on with the one that's empty. You, what you do is you, there we go. You slide the shaft out of the middle. Okay, so you've now just got your crossed arms. And you imagine here a ball wound around the crosses. Then all you do is you slide these apart and take them out. And you're left with your ball of yarn, which is there ready for plying or knitting or whatever. So that's oh, a really good. Fascinating. Idea. I've never seen that done before. It's been great. Yeah. So that, that's, that's a good one. And, and they're, they're usually quite slow and quite steady and keep going. So that's another good one for a beginner. Okay. So, and also with the CD ones. Um, I don't know if any of you have sort of followed me put postings on Facebook and things, but I tend to do an awful lot of walking for my health. And I found it was cutting into my spinning time. So I now spin as I walk. And this is this is one that I use for sock weight yarn. So I'm doing finer on that. So I managed to find some of the smaller CDs. So I can see put the two together. No, it's the it's the small CDs. Yeah. Okay. There we are. That's better. So I'll demonstrate on this one for now. Brilliant. Okay, so if you've never had a spindle before, let's see. Now, what I would suggest is you either start with, if you're going to start with wash fleece and card it into row lags, or if you've got tops, we can make what we call faux lags. Okay, so you're going to get yourself a length of top probably a bit thick. So we're going to pull a chunk off. Okay. Uh, now I'm 
going to swap to the other camera set for this one just so you can see my knees. And I'm going to just open that one out just slightly, sort of, just till it's a nice even layer. And then I'm going to, with my fingers, I might see a bit of glitter in that. That's, that's the problem with spinning gl glitter. You find it forevermore. I've got a question, Amanda. Um, somebody's asking about the spindle. How heavy is too heavy? Um, I think when you're starting, you might be looking somewhere around 25 to 35 grams. If you start going much over 40 grams, I would say that's probably starting to get a little bit heavy. Yeah. So I've not, I've not actually weighed one of these recently. I don't know. Maybe, maybe this might be 40-ish, but this one's not too bad. Yeah, I have, that's an, actually another good point. With the CD spindles, you can vary the weight because the, the way I make them, the screw thread will actually hold up to three. Mm -hmm. So you might want three if you're applying. You might want two for a thicker yarn. And on this one, you could go down to one and make it a little bit. I think you take about 10 grams or so every time you take a CD off. Mm, that's that's exactly. another reason why they're really, really good to start on. You can vary the weight on them. Yeah. Yeah. I, ideally, probably 30, 35 grams. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 40 would be okay. But don't Is go that, for the really heavy wooden ones. Is okay. that CD spindle... Um easy to make someone's asking like is it something we could each do at home yes um right sorry interrupting your flow but we've got questions no no no, no that's up. fine questions are fine let's see if i can get this yarn off and show you oh thank you mm -hmm. well, i'm not got it all off but if you can see that appearing there is a plastic nut yeah now that is a gland nut. It's an electrical part. It's meant for putting through a, a metal cabinet to run your wires through so that the metal <laughs> cabinet doesn't cut them. But it is absolutely brilliant for a spindle. It will okay. take about, a, about an eight or nine millimeter dowel and it holds it firmly. And then at this end, you have the screw nut. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So you buy it as a gland nut and an extra little, uh, nut at the, the top it comes in two parts and then your cds just slide on slide over those threads fantastic a little wiggle and put your put your thread on Amazing. Seen, um, Faye has also just put a link in the chat um, to a demonstration of how to make one of these if oh, you want lovely. to go really? have a look yeah. at that later okay. brilliant yeah Anybody can make them. They're the best thing to learn on. And like I say, I because I'm walking and sometimes it's on a hard tarmac surface, I don't want to take out my lovely wooden ones and get them scratched up and dented. Yeah. Uh, so I take the CD one. If I break a CD, I just come home and put a new one on. So I usually take spares with me anyway. So Right. OK. Now, if you've no leader on, OK, we may as well start you off in the right way. If you've no leader on and you have a hook at the top, you're just going to hook a few fibres. Probably to start, you can see it on that one clearer. Okay, a oh, that's not very many. It's a few more fibres. So hook a few fibres in, stretch them off a little bit, and then just gently with your fingers start turning. Now, I, I always tend to spin clockwise and ply ante, but there's no real reason why you should. It's just what we do. So mm. if, you want, if you're happy of spinning the other way, feel free. So I'm just put, putting a little bit of twist in. I'm not dropping the spindle. I'm just turning it in my fingers till I can feel that that yarn's strong, okay? And we'll come up here and we'll stretch the fibres a little bit more, give us a bit more length. Right, okay. So I've now made my, by turning it in my fingers with the fibres hooked in the hook, I've made myself a starter length, yeah? Yeah. But what I'm going to do now, probably going to have to go to the other camera, shuffle my seat around. I'm now going to roll this down my leg. Now, I'm, I think, possibly left-handed here, so don't always take notice of me. Uh, but I tend to roll with my left hand, and I roll down toward, from my hip towards my knee, like that. And that goes clockwise. If you're going to use it in the other hand, okay, then you want to be 
the other side, so my right hand now, I want to, to roll it clockwise. I want to go from my knee up towards my hip. Yeah, I'm a lot, I'm very cack handed that way. It's all swap over. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that spinning. Okay, and we're going to, what we're doing is we're storing up some twist in that length of thread we've made. Now, I'm going to drop it and I'm going to put it between my knees. Okay, I'm going to get it up there. So, drop it between my knees. I'm keeping this tight and I'm pinching. And now, these fingers now that have been freed from holding the spindle, are going to come up and take over that pinch. So now I can release the grip on here, okay? And I'm going to gently stretch those fibres away from the spindle. Whoa, we've got too much twist there. So gently stretch them away. If you've got a lot of twist and it won't pull, then roll your fingers back down towards the spindle. Undo that twist till you feel the fibres are going thin and then you can slide your fingers up. Pinch at the top, pull the fibres out gently till you get the thickness you want, pinch, slide your fingers towards. So pinch, pull, pinch at the top, slide together. Pinch, pull, pinch and slide together. Okay, now we've got an arm's length now. So we're just going to make sure there's enough twist in there. Yeah, that's not looking bad. We're going to take that off the hook. And we're now going to wind it around underneath, keeping hold of it the whole time. Uh, right. Oh, which one are we in? No, we're better in that one. Sorry. And now we're going to wind it, wind it round clockwise. So I usually wind it the same way you're twisting. Now we're going to wind it around, and we're going to come up over the back edge of the disc. Okay. And we're going to come under the hook and catch the thread so that it'll hang there securely. Now we're back to exactly the same thing again. We're going to push it forwards. Mm, it's not rolling very well on the skirt. Okay, there we are. Build up some twist in that short length of thread. Now drop it between your knees. Put it as low down as possible. Pinch with the lower fingers. Relax the grip on here now and gently pull it away till you get the fibres of thickness. Pinch with the fingers at the back. Slide together, pinch, relax your grip, pull the fibres backwards, pinch and slide together. So you're always in control of that twist. Okay, just inching your way up the fibre. Okay, if you find you haven't got enough twist, you can always give it another little twizzle before you then wind it on. And that winding on now we've got started is easy. You just flick it out the hook. Keep it under tension and reel the spindle in towards your other hand. Okay, leave yourself a bit of five, a bit of yarn ready to start your next draft. There we are, hanging it in the hook. We'll just do that one more and then we'll move on. Okay, so pinch, pull, pinch, pull, pinch, pull. And now you'll see that I'm actually doing it while the spindle's dropping. Okay. Mm. So if you start off what we call park and draft by catching it in your knees, you'll you get some practice and you'll know when you're ready to start dropping the spindle, okay? And then that, that one's still going, but I would start, if I stood up, I would get a longer length, okay? So catch that, unhook it and reel it in. And you're making yarn, it's that easy. Fantastic. Okay, right, so... Any more questions on spindles or shall we move on to a wheel? Uh, yeah, people are wondering how you do that while you're walking along. And I'm wondering that too. Okay, well, that is many, many years practice. <laughs> um, I actually hold, this, I, I hold the drafting in front of my face. So I'm virtually drafting by feel and I'm looking through it to the track ahead. So I'm not actually I'm not actually spinning and not looking where I'm going. I'm more spinning by feel in front of my face. So I can occasionally have a quick look at it where I'm looking past it to the mm. path in front. Yeah. So that's okay. that's the secret, I think. Yeah. Get comfortable with it definitely first before you try it. We don't want I don't want anybody falling over and saying, Amanda said <laughs> health and safety reasons. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Twin trousers at home. <laughs> then you know 
try it there. But I would always say hold the drafting in front of your face so that mm -hmm. you are looking ahead of you. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've seen people knit and walk before, but I've never seen anyone oh, spin. Not tried that. That. No, I haven't tried that, but I'm, I'm quite good at the spindling. So yeah, fantastic. maybe I should because I've got I managed to fit the spinning in, but I don't manage to fit the knitting in. Mm. I've got about probably at least 10 or 12 jumpers with waiting. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> okay, right. So a spinning wheel. Now. We have a trusty Ashford traditional here. Okay, right. So if you're going to start to spin and you want a spinning wheel, I would always say have a go on the spindle first because that is there in front of you, very close. You can see what's happening, yeah? But when you're ready to start on a spinning wheel, you can't really go wrong with an Ashford traditional if you want to choose your first wheel. They're um, so popular. There's so many of them around. You're likely to get one second hand. And when you've done with it, someone will snap it off your hand. Yeah, they're, they really keep the value. And they're, everybody always wants an Ashford traditional. Okay, so now, um, first things first, it's moving components and they rub together with friction. They need oil. So... I always start my beginner classes with a lesson on oiling, okay? Mm -hmm. So you want to, uh, can see here we've got the front maiden. It's called front and back maiden, and they're coming from the mother of all. So the mother and the two daughters, the maidens, mother right. and the maidens, okay? Now you have uh, varying wheels, have varying materials. This is a very old one, so we're still on leather. And we have a little, little piece of leather with a hole in at the front and a little piece of leather with a hole in at the back. And those are what the whole bobbin and flyer system are sitting on. And those are going to, when you get going, they're going to spin round very fast. So they're going to want a little spot of oil at both ends. Okay. So where it goes into the bearings. Now, your other thing that's going to move around is your bobbin on the shaft. Yeah. See that one's moving freely. So yeah. that needs a tiny spot of oil. And I usually just, if the, if the bobbin's on there, I'll put a spot on back and front. Um, if the bobbin's off, uh, it depends whether it's a modern bobbin that has a little bearing at either end or whether it's one where the whole shaft comes in, whole centre comes into contact with the shaft. In that case, I might run a little bit of oil along the shaft. And then we've got a little bit of leather back and front that the bobbin is resting in. Mm. Also got a question about the type of oil that you're using. Right, that's a very, very good question. Because if, like me, you've still got the old leather bearings, then you want to use, I would use a sort of an engine oil, a mineral type oil, something, something which's reasonably thick so it stays there. You can use sewing machine oil at a pinch, but that that will soon disappear you know, if you're spinning for any length of time. Um, so a good clean engine oil. I like to use neats for oil, but this is the one case where I wouldn't because a neats for oil is um, leather conditioning oil. It, it's used for saddlery and it, it will soften the leather. And that is exactly what you don't want for your bearings. Because if you start getting your bearings all sloppy, your, your bobbin will rock around all over the place. So I like neats for oil, but I wouldn't use it on leather bearings. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, a clean engine oil is good. Some people use gun oil. Definitely don't recommend anything like with conditioners in like WD-40. Mm. Um, and uh, like I say, a sewing machine oil is good if you're stuck, but I wouldn't use it regularly. Okay, now the other place we're going to do it, if you can see this, is I'm pushing the wheel away from the upright where it's sitting. And I can find the little metal shaft that goes through the centre of the wheel. And that's needs a little bit of oil as well. So I'll push it from this side as well, and I can drop a little bit of oil in there. Okay. okay. And the other place we would want it would be the end of the treadle. Ah, you can see it. Right, right down here, there's a little metal pin at either end of the treadle bar that goes into the wood. And that's where, if you get a, sometimes if you get one of these that hasn't been looked after properly, 
you know, it's been a bit dried out, you'll get a, a sound like a, a duck. Oh, we had one at Gilt today that sounded like the deck of a ship creaking in, in the wind. Um, that's usually the, the treadle that needs oiling. Okay, so now you're going to want to oil the hub and the treadle maybe, I don't know, once every couple of months or so. That's just sort of maintenance. But you really want to oil the fast bit, the flyer and bobbin, every time you sit down to it. Okay, so... How to set up a wheel. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we've got, we've got on, on this one, it's a bit unusual. It's the only, one of the few that I know of that has this. And it has what we call a tilt tensioner. If I take that band off a bit, you can see that this whole head moves in towards the wheel and away from the wheel again. And you can imagine if you pull it away from the wheel, it tightens up the band. So if you drive band slipping, you want to you want to move your whole head away from the wheel to tighten it up. OK, so what we're going to do to start with, is we're going to take that off. Right. And we're going to treadle. OK, and nothing happens because I've slackened that band so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just going to gently screw you see the knob there gently screw the knob and bring the flyer up away from the wheel and can you see it now starting to move it's a bit hesitant so we'll go a bit further but it is now turning so what you're looking for is just the right amount of tension on the band so that it turns the flyer and you can stop and you can start it again without mm, a slight bit of hesitation there. So I'll up it a little bit more, but you should be able to stop and start again without any wishing or slipping. You get a whooshing sound from here if it's slipping. So that seems to be going okay. And what we call this is lowest working tension. Now this wheel will work if you get the band tighter, but what you're doing is you're making it so much harder on your leg, treadling it, because you've got to push harder. So you want to set the band at just the right tension so that it'll make everything move without you having to do too much effort on the treadle. Right, so everything's going around nicely. Now, what we've got there is there's nothing on the wheel. So the bobbin and the flyer are just, just freewheeling around, yeah? We're driving the flyer and the bobbin's freewheeling with it. So now, to make this wheel take on yarn, we need to be able to... Get the flyer to keep going and we need to slow the bobbin down. So to do that, we have what we call a scotch tension band. And this is a brake band. We're going to put that over onto the bobbin. And we've got a little knob here so that we can let loosen it or tighten it, okay, in degrees. And I have a little, you can either have a spring on there or I tend to use a rubber band. So I've got a rubber band under the hook the other side. Just gives me a little bit of stretch, okay? And now I'm going to see if this will still work with the bobbin. Oh. Yes, yes, it does. That's fine. So it's still okay at the moment. Now, what you'll see is happening, because there's no yarn tied up, the flyer's going around and the bobbin's being held by the brake. Okay, now I'm going to get the yarn and I'm going to put it over the hooks and I'm going to come out through the orifice and hopefully I've got a hook. Yes, there we go. I'm going to come out through the orifice. So I'll hook, hook that in, come out through there. Okay, now what I've done is I've, oops, through your hooks, I've tied the flyer to the bobbin with this yarn. So now what will happen is everything should go around together and the band should skid a little bit. Oh, now look. N now, do you see that? It didn't, I started treadling, but nothing happened. It's, yeah, it's a bit, because I put so much more friction on by having to, to drive the bobbin and the flyer, then it's, it wants just a fraction more tension on the wheel drive band. So I'm now going to just tweak that one up. And when we get that set right, so that now it will, it will go nicely, even though I've got the bobbin tied on, and then that's your lowest working tension. That's good. Okay. 
Everything's moving freely and it's not hard effort on your leg to treadle. Okay, so the way this works is I've got the yarn here and I've got a very, very light brake tension so I can hold it comfortably and nothing's going anywhere until I just say, right, I want to feed in and I release the tension and the wheel will take it away from me. And I should also be able to pull it back out with no braking or anything. Nothing's going to snap because it's a very nice light tension. And that's why you need to set your wheel up. Okay. So what's happening is while I'm holding it, everything's going around together. As soon as I release the tension on the thread that I've got held out here, then the bobbin is taken, it's grabbed by the brake band and slowed a little bit. And the flyer keeps going around and wraps the yarn on. Now, this is what we call a single drive scotch tension. You also might find a wheel. The other most common one would be a double drive. Now, what you have there is it works very similar, but instead of driving the flyer and breaking the bobbin, your, your bobbin is a little nearer the wheel and there's a groove on the bobbin too at this end. And you have one band that goes around in a figure of eight and it goes around once around the flyer and then comes around again over the bobbin, okay? And it's exactly the same thing, but this time, instead of driving the flyer and stalling the bobbin so that the yarn winds on, you have these two at different speeds so that your, your, bo your bobbin is on a smaller speed, smaller whirl, goes faster, okay? And then that one actually pulls the yarn in. Okay, so that's the difference between a double drive and a scotch tension. Yeah. Okay, let's grab a little bit of fluff here. Oh, so it's a bit, a little bit. Okay. And exactly the same again. Uh, this time I've got from the end of the fibre, but I think if you were a beginner, a beginner, I might tend to make a faux lag as well. But it's exactly the same as you're doing on the spindle. You pull out some thread and you pit and you slide back. You pull out some thread forwards and you slide back. You pull out some thread forwards and you slide back. Okay. Now, the amount of twist you're going to get in there, with the spindle, you know, it's just a small amount of twist and you stop it and wind it on. But this has got continuous twist all the time you're treadling. Okay. And what you do here is to get a nice even twist, you have to feed a set amount forward onto your bobbin every time you press the treadle, okay? So let's have a, a quick look there at, just very quickly, have a look at how that works. We have, oh, hang on, stop that there. We have a flyer whirl, which on this one, I think, is about... It'll, it'll fit six times into this main wheel. I think it's actually six and a half, okay? What you can, and we won't do it now because we're running a little bit short on time, but what you can do is you can get your wheel and tie a thread on a spoke here and so that you can see which, which spoke's at the top. You can turn the wheel slowly once by hand till your max spoke comes to the top again and you can count how many times the flyer goes around. So if you get a wheel that you don't know the ratio on, you can do it like that. So what you need to find is how fast the flyer is going for every time you treadle the wheel. And on this one, like I say, it's about six and a half. So if I press the treadle at six and a half twists, six and a half twists. So if I feed in an inch, then I get six and a half twists every time I feed forwards if I do the same as my foot. So every time you press your foot down, feed an inch in forwards, feed an inch in, and then you'll get six and a half treadles in every inch. If you have a different size world, it might be five, it might be eight, you know, but if that's the way to get even spinning is you need to feed in a set amount for every time you treadle. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. And now let's have a quick look at how you're going to set up a electric wheel. Now, um, I've seen several models of different models of electric wheel, and I got a feeling that 
they are basically all exactly like this one, Scotch tension. So we have a motor, no, that way. I'm looking at the screen and facing the wrong camera. Here we go. So we have a little motor pulley. So in, in this housing here is the motor. We have a motor pulley. So instead of my foot pumping up and down to turn the big wheel, we've got a motor in there doing the work and it's turning this, this that's effect. You can see it's moving the flyer. Yeah. So that's yeah. driving the flyer around. Okay. And at the back on the bobbin, we have exactly the same thing. We have a little brake band. It's on a spring there and it's around a little tension knob on the other side. There. So we've got a little tension dial. We can make that spring go very tight or very loose. Okay. And it works with very small uh, tension adjustments. It's exactly the same that way. Okay. Now we on this side, we have a dial for the speed. Okay, so this is the same as having different sized uh, pulleys on the flyer. We can just adjust how fast it goes around with the speed dial there. And the other, only other button we've got is one that reverses it. So we can have it going clockwise if it's down this side or flip the button anti-clockwise and it goes the other way. Okay, so that's fairly simple. And on this one, I've also got a foot treadle. This down here comes down onto the floor. So I've got my nice handy little foot treadle on the floor. There we are. Oh, there we are. Nice handy little foot treadle down on the floor. So I don't have to reach in past the fly arounds to get at the switches. Okay. Perfect. Um, somebody's asked um, if you're using your right hand to feed into the bobbin and left hand to draft the yarn, um, would it be different to using the other hand or the other way around? Does that make a difference? No. No. No, it's perfectly. Um, yeah, you're, 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 sitting, you're sitting treadling there. You can have either hand at the front. Doesn't really matter, no. I think you might find if you're watching me, I look a bit cack handed because I've got a feeling I'm basically left handed for the spinning. So I might be a wrong way around to everyone else. But no, it doesn't matter at all. Good to know. Okay, so let's have a little go and show you this one spinning around. Let's grab a bit of fluff. Oh, oh I don't know what that is, but it looks interesting, right? <laughs> okay. Hey. Oh, this is a this is a coat top, I think. Find an end. Any end will do. Oh. It looks nice and fluffy. Okay. Yeah. Night. Okay. And away we go. Oh, now I've been fiddling with the tension at the back there. That now won't pull on. So let me give that a little bit of a tweak, that little knob I showed you just now. Oh, much better. Oh, no, nope, still not going to wind on. All right, give me how, how can you tell that the tension is wrong? Uh, because it, when the tension's right, I let go and it just winds in nicely for me. Mm. Uh, this one isn't winding in. No. It's always like this, isn't it? When you're doing something live, it's never going to work easily. <laughs> it's caught around the hook. Ah, uh, there we go. Ah, there we go. That's it. In you go. In you go. That's it. And it was working just before we started. Let's give it. Let's give it a help. Helping hand. Right. That's better. Still want a little bit more, I think. But that switch down there is a, is a real godsend, having that on there. There we go. That's better. Okay. Oh, that looks lovely. So, Amanda, we had a question um, with tops. What sort of preparation do you have to do before you can start spinning from it? Good quality tops, very little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll come on to that one in a sec, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. We'll, so we'll just... 
Okay, so that one is going fairly fast. So I just turn my dial and I'm going to make it go much slower. In fact, it's actually quite good for a beginner because you can get it to go really, really slowly if you want to. Mm. Once you get the hang of it, you can come up really quite fast. Yeah, so you can have it at whatever speed you like. So that's really quite good. Okay. Fabulous. Right, so tops. Ah, okay. Now this one, I've got some photos to show you in a minute. Better move, I get a move on. Um, yeah, so this is the new one. Hawk moth, is it called? It's a lovely blue so, one. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? yeah, okay. So very little needs doing with it. So if you're going to, if you're a beginner, then I would say go for the Folax, the false, what we call false Rolex. So you're just going to take a piece off the end, okay? And you're going to, like I did with the, with the white, you're just going to open it out, okay? And then you're going to roll it, roll it on the knee, it's easier, okay? And what I would say with these is to roll them quite firmly, Okay, so you don't want that shape to collapse on you. So there we have a nice little roll lag made from a piece of top, and there you are ready to go again. Yeah. And then you pull from the end of the, the roll. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I was doing this with the multicolor and I was testing it out, and I've got some photos to show you. And what I was doing is I was just doing it from the end. And as you can see, because the stripes are now rolled around, I get one stripe after another and I can get flecks of the colour appearing. Because sometimes with these beautiful colours, when you spin them, they just all merge and you lose them. So I've done some samples to show you of what you can get with these lovely coloured tops if you actually just try different methods, okay? So that's an easy one. Another good one when you're learning and good for colour is to take a piece off the end. Okay, now you need to be fairly careful that you just get the staple length. Okay, so a piece like this, and then you're going to put your finger in the middle and fold it over, and you're going to just lightly grip the ends. Now it's doing a very similar thing to the row lag, because you can see there, I've got the stripes across my finger. And if I start spinning from this edge, so I just get the wheel pulling the fibres out from the edge and I'm getting mainly the blue first. And then when the blues run out, I go to a darker black part and then I get to these lovely gold stripes, yeah? Mm. So you're you're going to keep the colours that way. So that, there is very little. Um, you could split them down if you're not happy spinning from a, a full length of top. But the other way is I would probably just lay it out and try and find where it's folded over because they're usually a flat web but they tend to be folded over so I'll just sort of gently gently open it out okay and then I'm quite happy then sitting there and spinning and if I'm wanting the colors again I can watch and I can spin down this edge because there's a blue bit and then the, there's a nice gold bit appearing in the center there okay so I can go from the blue to the gold to the dark, to the gold again, and hopefully I can get a few colours on that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. What I'll do That's now, then, I'll just show you, uh, just quickly before we get to the questions, I'll share screen and show you what I did with those. You might have to look carefully. So here we've got the um, new hawk moth top. Um, that one's the harvest juice. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So this harvest juice hawk moth. And I did some sampling because um, the top's such beautiful colours and I was trying to get to, to see if I could get those colours to stay in the yarn. Now, because if you, if you pull them just as they come from the top, without any special preparation, you tend to get a very, very nice blend and it'll go, it'll look more like a, a little bit away from it. It looks more like a sort of a dark olive color. And I mm -hmm. wanted to see if I could get some of those colors in. So I've done some sampling. Lovely. Okay. So what we've got here 
is the folax. So in each of the pictures I'm going to show, down the center is the one where I just play, paid no special attention. I just spun a finish yarn from the end of the top and let all the colors merge. Now, I think you need to look quite closely, but the ones either side, I've got distinct flecks of color in there. You can, you can particularly see on the three ply on the left, well, it's the left to me, um, it's got quite bright um, touches and flecks of gold in there, which was, and occasionally there's some darker of the blue bits as well. Yeah, so I you think can really tell. I think that one has, has worked quite well. Yeah. Um, mm, okay. Next, we have from the fold. And again, the one in the center is no particular um, preparation, but the three ply and the two ply again. I know what I'm looking for and I can distinctly see some, some good um, speckles of the color in there. And I think actually knitted up, they, were, they were, probably would look even more um, distinct. So that's from the fold. I really think there's not much difference between those two. So I think that would come down, if you wanted to try it, that would probably come down to which method you were more familiar and comfortable mm -hmm. at spinning. Okay. Yeah. And now from the end, now this is the one that I expected because this is how I normally spin a, a, a multicolored top. This was the one I expected to get the best results from. Now on here, we've got the two ply on the left and the three ply on the right. And yes, you can still see distinct colors. I think possibly more in the two ply, but it wasn't as distinct as I was expecting. I thought this one was going to be the, the most distinct. Mm -hmm. But still, I think you could, you've got some colours. But here we have faux lags from the fold and from the end all together, so you can see. Yeah, I think, so the, the faux lags have given you a lot more speckle than the others. Yes, I think... With the, my untrained eye. Yes, yeah. This, from the fold, yes. Because yeah. this, this is what most people would do if, mm -hmm. they, you know, if they were trying to keep the colour. Most people yeah. know to try from the fold. But I think the faux lags, just like you say, looking at them from a slight distance, they're, they're slightly more, I think. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Okay. Um, so uh, if anyone wants to um, talk and uh, ask a question out loud, um, now is the time. I've just seen a very good question. Yeah, go on. Yeah. So what happens if your colours are horizontal rather than vertical? So we're talking about space dyeing, I think. Okay. Now, um, yeah, you're going to get much longer lengths of colour and you have two major options. Uh, if, you, if you're doing a straight two-ply, you could split your braid in half or your length of top in half and try and get two that match. You might have to do a little bit of fudging if you really want them to match at the blind stage. The other very good way of doing it, or two very good ways, um, is to do a, a whole braid. Uh, well, if you do the whole braid, you get very, very long colours. You've got, you've got a choice. If you split the braid, you get shorter and shorter and shorter colour lengths. But you choose the colour length you want. You spin one bobbin and you then chain ply or Navajo ply it. And that keeps your colours perfectly. If you're doing that, make sure it's a nice bouncy fibre that will fluff out and cover the um, loops in your Navajo ply. Uh, don't do it with mohair or a long wool because they, their loops always show and open out. Okay. Uh, the other way to do it would be to spin it around a core so that you're just you're using your nice fancy multicolor top as a decorator, and then you'll get all the colours in order to down it another way. That's one of the things we're going to be covering tomorrow, actually. Yeah, because we're doing another chat tomorrow about slightly more advanced techniques. Yeah. 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 So yeah. You're, you're all, of course, welcome to join us for that one tomorrow at half past five. Mm. We, had, uh, we had another question about um, what kind of tops you recommend for beginners. Right, something, if you're going to start with tops, you want something that isn't a blend, so just one breed if you can get it. Um, go for something of a medium length, um, three, four, five inches is good. 
So, mm-hmm. and something that's not too fine, definitely don't start on a merino. So, um, oh, any a lot of the a lot of the English breeds are really quite good. Thought, please. Um, Mm. Yeah, Sonia recommended the Exmoor Blueface. Exmoor Blueface, that's a really good one. Some Something with a bit of bite that's going to hold on to itself. Don't have anything too slippery when you're a beginner, because it'll just, yeah. you know, it might get away from you. Mm. But Jay is dropping some links yeah. in the chat for you all if you're interested. Mm. Oh, right, lovely, yeah. And if also, if you're doing the, if you're making the faux legs and having a spiral, that helps as well. Because the the you know the fibers of the wool. If you've got a nice, really bouncy wool with with lots of um, hooks on the fibers, they have they, you know they have scales that hook together. You get one that's really nice and bouncy and hooks together well. Then when you make it into a row lag, it'll spiral around. And as you pull the fibers off at the front, they're spiraling spiraling around and they're pulling fibers with them after. So that's a really good way of keeping it going. So a nice medium bouncy top medium yeah. length and, and make it into your roll that's a good way of starting lovely and we do lots of these um undyed natural fibers uh, as tops um yeah. on our website have a look on fiber tops and look by fiber content yeah. um people are often seduced by our uh, more shiny exciting colors with the silk in well, um, get them to look at but don't start with them you know. <laughs> yeah something, something to you know aim at for in the yeah. future yeah, but make it easy on yourself and start with one of the really nice... Yeah, something you know, with that bit of grip is what yeah, you need to just help yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, that's good advice. So somebody's asked, um, how many metres of yarn can you make in an hour? Say, sock weight, for example. Ooh. Have you ever measured? No idea. No? You know, um, like what weight, like how many grams you would spin? Maybe mm, sock weight, or or any weight if you yeah. Know. Right, maybe maybe five or ten grams an hour of sock weight. Okay, because it's quite fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gosh. out on the spindle. Yeah, probably put five or ten grams on a on out in a walk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And is it um faster on a um a spinning wheel then? Um. Only in the fact that you don't have to stop to wind on. It's all all automatic. Actually, I'm more even on a, on a spindle than a wheel because every little bit is right in front of my face. Mm. I actually see what's going on. I can spin a lot more even on my spindle. That actually brings us on to a, another question we've got here about thickness of yarn. How, how do you do different thicknesses? Right. Yeah, that's a very good one. Um, Where's the? Oh, we'll do it with this one. Yeah. Okay. So, if you pull a few fibers from the very end, okay, and you put twist in and you pull a few fibers from the very end, you're going to get a very fine yarn. If you then ping your fingers further back into your fibers and pull, you get a much thicker. Hmm. So it's just where you place your fingers. If you put them, if you put them right on the tip and pull, very, you get very, very fine yarn. Yeah. You bring your fingers further back into the fiber supply back here and you pull, you've immediately got a thicker yarn. Hmm. So and it's where you position position your fingers and how much fiber you're pulling forwards. Could you also adjust the thickness um, through plying? Yes, you can do that as well, yeah. And depending what you're making, um, it can be a good idea anyway. Um, If you're making socks, for instance, most people recommend at least three ply for socks. So three or four ply. The more plies you have, um, the less of the individual plies on the surface. So it shares out the wear around more strands. So it's supposed to help with wear. And if also, if you've got a very, very short fibre, it's, uh, could you imagine a very, very short fibre on a very thick yarn? They're going to be, you know, individual fibres sort of wrapping around the outside. And, and you twist it and you don't actually get all those fibres in the twist. So they're going to rub off and pill. So if you've got a very, very short fibre 
then you need to make very fine yarns. And if you want it thicker, you do multiplies. You yeah. can't really make a sound thick yarn from very short fibre. It's sort of physically impossible. Right. I see. I see. Laura's already started uh, spinning a little bit there. So you obviously inspired uh, us. Yeah, I was doing that along with you. I hope I can't see everyone else at the whole hundred people. However, how many we've got? But I hope there are other people out there with their little bits yeah. of tops going. Oh, okay. This is how I do it. Yeah. And I just yeah, fiddled no. it together. Wee. <laughs> It's been super inspiring and I'm definitely gonna gonna give it a go. Next time I'm down at the mill, I'll grab myself some fiber. Any tips from getting the kemp out of a herd wick? Wow. I'm talking about getting it out, but um it's it can be if it's not too wiry, it can be a nice fleece. I've got some on the go for making boot socks. So you give it a shake, some of it might come out. Some of it'll come out when you're spinning. But Mm -hmm. Hedwig's nice. All fleeces have got their own uses. Yeah, yeah, that's it. They've got their own kind of characteristics and and characters, don't they? Oh, it's a fascinating thing when you once you get into different fleeces. For sure. Yeah. Um, so I I hope everyone's uh, enjoyed the session and and I hope we've covered everyone's questions. Um, if there's any last minute questions, uh, pop them in the chat now. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll start winding down. I see we've run a little bit over, but not by much. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's been wonderful to chat to you, Amanda. Okay. Um, and thank really you. Really interesting to watch and see how you do it. I've, I've seen it occasionally, but not really sort of understood what's happening. Yes. <laughs> so to see it and, and well, have you explain it, it's really great. To take beginners here in ones, twos, or threes, or. And I've also got a beginner spinner class coming up in October at the Loom Shed. So where, where are you based, Amanda? I'm down in Cornwall. So, tomorrow, so just about the dead centre of Cornwall. Lovely. Well, you, you travel as well, don't you? Um, across yeah, you the travel day. around to guilds and things, yeah. Yeah. But I yeah, should so the Loom what, Shed in October. Where could people find out about uh, upcoming events? Um... Well, I don't, I don't do an awful lot of sort of set classes at events and things, but yeah, just email me. Yeah, if you put my name on Google, I think I come up. I got a website; it's a bit out of date, but the email me link still works. So. When we when we email everyone the the images later, we'll uh, we'll pop a link to your website in there as well. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, and then uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Half five. Ooh, we all do some fancy yarns. Yeah, we'll expand our knowledge even more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks everyone for coming to watch. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, and do join us again for the show and tell that's uh, starting later today. It is starting at six thirty. Yeah. So Ooh, lovely. Join us then if you want to show up some of your John Harbour makes um, or work in progress or what, yeah, show us what you got on your needles. It'll be fabulous to see you again then. All right. Take care, everybody. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.